everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Nir Davidson. I'm from the Weizmann Institute. Uh, I'm a physicist. This is my first uh, Zoom seminar. Uh, so let's hope uh, me and you will survive it. Um, I was told uh, that uh, there is flexibility regarding audience uh, participant response and questions. So I see you know how to raise your hands. This is very good. Because uh, this is only positive. Uh, I hope some of you know the question and answer option. So I encourage you uh, to use it. Uh, I will probably look every few minutes if there are questions and then I may answer them all the way to the end. And then in the very end, uh, I will try, there is an option where you can actually talk your questions. Uh, we probably will do it in the end for those that will uh, survive. So those that want to ask or comment, please use the question and answer. And now it's one minute after five, so I think it's a good time uh, to start. Okay, so again, welcome everyone. Um, I work on lasers, and uh, the picture that you see on the screen is something that I see almost every day. So let me uh, go uh, and compare these two pictures uh, and explain you what are speckles, why they are annoying, uh, especially if you do laser imaging, and then how to get rid of them. So if you look on the picture on the left, this is a resolution target, uh, and uh, you see these uh, meaningless shapes, but they look rather uniform. And this is done with a low-tech flash lamp. So you just take any lamp in your room and you take the image, uh, and this is what you get. This is what I will call a high resolution or high quality image, where the square or the stripes are uniform. If I look on the right side, I hope you can see the mouse, you can see, you can barely recognize the same shapes. You can see the square here is the same square here, but now they are uh, imposed with these uh, annoying dots, which look completely random. They look uh, varying all the way in intensity from completely dark to very bright. This I will, property I will call contrast. Contrast means the variation. Here the contrast is zero because there are almost no variation. And here the contrast is one. Contrast one means that the variations are on the, av uh, on the order of the mean. Uh, and these uh, spots are speckles, or sometimes called laser speckles. They are produced whenever you use laser, coherent laser radiation for imaging. Please don't confuse them with these uh, nice speckles that you could see on this uh, uh, Dalmazzo. Some people have artistic uh, view and they like to see these patterns, but most of us would like to see the left picture rather than the right picture. So this is the topic uh, of uh, the uh, Zoom seminar, and I hope at least in the end you will understand why speckles are formed, how we can rid of them, and why sometimes we actually don't want to get rid of them because we want to use them. So sometimes these shapes will be useful. Okay, so let's start with the fact that lasers are very uh, popular and common in uh, life and uh, in uh, science and in engineering. And I'm giving you here several examples. This is, would be material processing. You can see that by focusing the laser beam on a small spot, you can actually cut through metal. Uh, this is where you use laser beams to press a uh, hydrogen uh, and deuterium and tritium and to make controlled fusion. It doesn't work yet, but this is very, this is probably the strongest laser in the world. This is an artistic view of a laser shooting down uh, missiles, you see, uh, on this peaceful city. Uh, this doesn't exist yet, but who knows? And, and this is called an artificial guide star. Uh, you shine a laser into the sky and you create a virtual target that you can use to correct the aberrations caused by the atmosphere. So all these aberrations, all these applications, and let me add this application, which I like very much. If you want to cut your pizza, you can do it with the laser. This is recommended for students at Weizmann that work long hours. And this is a joke, by the way. Uh, so all these applications are based on the ability of taking the laser light and focus it into a very small spot. And the typical spot size would be the order of the wavelengths of the radiation, which is one micron, one millionth of a meter or one thousandth of a centimeter. To get this sharp focusing, which is again important for all these applications, you need two things. The first thing that you need is a good lens. So let's assume that we have a good lens. 
And the second, you needed the radiation source, which is uh, shown here by the rays, would be of high quality. And uh, in this picture, you see that all the incoming rays have to be parallel to each other. Only when these two requirements uh, exist, again, high quality source, parallel incoming beams, and high quality lens, then you will get this extraordinary focus uh, that you can achieve with lasers. Focus all your energy into a tiny spot on the order of a micro. Let me introduce the first non-trivial uh, statement in this seminar, I have a few. Uh, this is the same picture as you've seen here, it's a focus beam. But now instead of showing you the rays of the light, I'm showing you the wavefront. This is the phase of the light, and this surface is the, uh, is the surface of constant phase. So it's called a wavefront, or a phase front. It's the front of the phase. And what you can see here, that the front of the phase is perpendicular to the direction of the ray. This is a mathematical property, but if we want to stay in a hand waving, can you see my hands waving? We would say that a uniform phase enables the tight focusing. So here it comes, here is the statement. Parallel rays are equivalent to uniform phase fronts, which I will call coherence. Coherence is the property of a wave where the phase front is uniform. Namely, if I know what is the phase here, I also know what is the phase here. This is the definition of coherence, and you see that coherence is just another way to describe the high quality parallel rays, which are important to focusing. And this is why the coherence of the laser is so important for all the applications that I've shown you here. Okay? There are other properties of lasers, short pulses, etc., but uh, in this talk, we are going to concentrate on coherence. As a counterexample, uh, this is on my backyard, on the Weizmann campus. This is the solar tower. You see it's this tower. Here you have about uh, 100 huge mirrors. The size of the mirrors is about 3,000 meters square. It's the size of a football uh, field. And they focus the light beam here. And they try to, as hard as they can, to generate a tight focus in order to uh, use the solar energy and to heat something, to generate energy. The size of this spot, you may see it here, is about a meter square, meter by meter. You remember that I told you that the size here of a focused laser can be a micron by a micron, namely a micron square. Now think of the ratio between a micron square and a meter square. Let me do it for you. The ratio is 10 to the 12. So it's a, it's a hundred billion fraction between the area of this beam and the area of this beam. Why? Because the light, the sun is not a coherent source. The rays of light coming from the sun are not parallel. The phase fronts coming from the sun are not uniform. So you can see this dramatic difference, 12 orders of magnitude, not because these uh, mirrors are bad, they are good, they're as good as, as this lens. Because coherent source can be focused to a tiny spot, whereas incoherent source, like the sun, or the uh, um, spot in your uh, ceiling, uh, can be focused to a much larger beam. This is why we like coherence so much, this is why we like laser so much, and this is what's responsible to all these applications, especially the pizza one. Okay, just to give you another feeling of what is the importance of having this uniform wavefront, you can see that when the wavefronts are uniform, the beam stays parallel to a long distance. Why would you like that? Why would you like to have these parallel rays going to a long distance without spreading. This is an example. People took a laser. In this building, there exists a laser. And they send this laser out into the sky. Here it's going into the sky until it hits the moon. This is 300,060 kilometers. When it hits the moon, it sees this mirror. This is actually a retroreflector for the exports. It's not a mirror, it's a retroreflector. This was left by the astronauts of Apollo 14. And what this mirror or retroreflector does, it reflects the light back until it comes back into this same lens, focused into a detector. Only one out of 10 to the 17 photons, which are sent to the moon, return back into the detector. This is still enough to measure the time it took this laser pulse to go back and forth. And knowing the velocity of light, which we know very well, we can assess the distance to the moon, or rather to this mirror that is sitting on the moon, with about one millimeter accuracy. 
So 300,000 kilometers we measure with one millimeter accuracy because we have the ability to send light, collimated light, to this very large distance and collect it back. If the beam was even slightly non-collimated, think how big this spot would be after 300,000 kilometers. Even as it is, the best collimation that we can achieve gives us this poor property. By the time the, the beam gets to the moon, the size of the beam is many, many kilometers. So we only reflect a tiny fraction of that. Okay, so this long introduction uh, is supposed to convince you that coherence is a very important property. It's a uniform phase, well-defined uniform phase, or parallel rays, if you like rays better, and this is a, a common to many, many applications. And what I'm going to show you, that sometimes this property of coherence is bad, because, for example, it will generate speckles. Then I will show you that sometimes this coherence is okay, because we can use these speckles to sense. And if I have time, in the end, I will show you that coherence is actually excellent, because I'll show you that you can take many, many lasers, independent lasers, and combine them into a single beam. So we'll see if we have time. We'll always start with the bad things, and then okay, and then if we have time, we'll say something good towards them. So coherence is bad. This is a, for those of you that, that like to throw stones into the water, this is another example of wave interference. You see, I saw one stone here, another stone here. These are ripples that go onto the water. And if you look carefully where the spot is, I hope you can see it. This is a virtual laser spot. You can see that when the waves from the left and when the waves from the right uh, overlap, they interfere. And interference means that sometimes add, waves add, there's addition, and sometimes there is subtraction. Subtraction occurs when the maxima of one wave meets the minima of the other wave. So this is the basic property of waves. It's known for hundreds of years, and you can see it very nicely here. This is another example from uh, Wikipedia. If I take a laser beam, you see again this uniform phase, this is coherent laser beam, and I send it into two small slits. The light going each, from each one of these little holes spreads out. Uh, this one spreads, this one spreads, and when they meet on this screen, sometimes they uh, construct, so the phases are the same. Sometimes the phases are opposite and they destruct. So we have these interference fringes. This is called interference, wave interference. And this is the concept behind laser interferometers. So this is one example for a laser interferometer. You go to Zygo and you buy for a few thousand dollars this instrument. And what it does, it looks on these interference fringes. You see here they were straight. Here they are curved a little bit. This maps basically the curvature of the surface that you reflect. If you want to see if you have a flat surface or a curved surface, surface, you use one of these interferometers. And they have spectacular resolution. This is sub-micro resolution. If you want to go to a more dramatic laser interferometer, again, showing you why coherence is so useful, so you go to this instrument, which is called LIGO. LIGO is laser interferometer for gravitational observation. So the idea is that you take, you build two lasers interferometer. This is one. And this is the second one, it goes out of the picture. The length of each interferometer is three kilometers, and you have two. And now suppose that a billion light years away, close to the edge of the universe, there are two black holes which are merging. And during this merger, they are losing energy, which is equivalent to several solar masses. So a mass which is equal to several suns, three or four, is turned into energy by E equal mc squared. And this energy is mostly emitted by gravitational waves, which mean nothing else that the, that the universe is distorted and distances are changes. Now, these gravitational waves travel one billion light years, so it takes them one billion years, and then they arrive to Earth, and they change the scale of the two interferometers, this one and this one differently, because they have direction. Let's say the direction is here. So this length between the two mirrors is changed. This is not changed. And the laser interference, which is sensitive to these phases, can measure that. And this was observed, uh, I think, September 2016, about four years ago. And, and this, what you see here, is the distortion of space-time by the gravitational wave generated by the merger of two black holes 1.4 billion light years away. The magnitude of this distortion of space-time the relative magnitude is about 10 to the minus 21, which means that this distance used to be three kilometers, 
and because of the gravitational wave was changed by 10 to the minus 21. That's less than the diameter of the proton. But this was visible because people know how to measure very, care, very precisely with laser interferometers. This is, by the way, the most precise measurement ever made by humans, or by anybody, probably. So, so far for this nice interference fringes that you see here. Now comes the problem. And the problem is this. Any surface that you take, it can be the wall, it can be your face, it can be a piece of paper, it can be your table, is not perfectly smooth. And actually it's quite rough as compared to the scale of the wavelengths of light, which is one micron. So now if I shine a laser beam on this surface and the laser beam is reflected from the surface, you can see that I have many independent sources where the height difference or the length difference between them is basically random on the scale of the wavelengths. And what we will get is this random interference between waves, which will generate this either ugly or beautiful shape that we call speckle. So you see here many, many shapes. If you are interested in statistics, I can tell you some fascinating facts, statistical facts about the distribution of intensities here. It turns out it's, it's really exciting, but I will not discuss it here because I want to focus on the more applicative uh, part. Uh, so this uh, uh, shape, uh, the one thing I want to say that this is universal. So the statistical properties of these speckles are universal, namely they will be the same if they are speckles generated from light reflected from the wall or light reflected from your face or light reflected from a piece of paper. They, are, they do not depend on the exact properties of the, of the surface. And just to give you a feeling why this effect is so dramatic, you'd say, let's take the surface and try to make it a bit more flat. I want to give you two formulas. I'm going to risk showing you two formulas. So the first formula has to do with what happens if I add intensities. Let's take this intensity and that intensity. So if one of them is much smaller than the other, this is one, and the other one will be 1%. Then when you sum these two intensities, you get 1.01. That's not so bad. Now, if you remember, what we have to do when we look on waves, we have to sum the amplitudes. And mathematically, the amplitude is the square of the intensity. So instead of one, I write here square root of one. Instead of 0.1, I write the square root of 1%, which is larger, it's 10%. Now I add this amplitude, but I want to know what is the intensity, so I square in the end. So taking the square root and taking the square looks like nothing is happening, but here I do the sum. And when I do that, one is one, the square root of 1% is 10%, so I get one plus one. Square is one plus 21. You see, it's not 1% addition, but the 1% added to the laser coherently, coherently meaning I am adding amplitudes, gives me 20%, much larger. But this plus can also be a minus. I hope you see it, it's not completely clear. So what happens if I take not a plus and a minus, not constructive, by destructive interference, I have one, minus the square root of 1%, so this is 0 0.9, square 0 0.81. You see these two numbers, I apologize for this calculation, these two numbers differ by a lot. They differ by 50%, and this is a result of having 1% of coherent interference. So you see this huge magnification, and this is the explanation for this universal behavior. Every little thing that happens here, that you try to avoid, but you cannot. Every little scattering, every little piece of dust will interfere coherently. This is coherently with the other ones, either with a plus or with a minus, and will create these huge variations. This 50% is a result of 1%. If you take few percent, you get 100% variations, all the way from dark to bright. So these are speckles, and we don't like them, usually. Let's try to get rid of them. So there's a very common trick that we do when we get noise in the labs. If, if you have engineers in the audience, I'm sure you all know this trick. You just take many measurements and you average and you hope that the noise goes away. So if these speckles are some kind of a noise, let's go to this, if it's some kind of noise, let's just average. So this is illustrated by this picture. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take this picture, it contains speckles, the contrast, I remind you, the contrast is the ratio between the, the brightest and the darkest point. Is unity, normalized. Uh, so we, one is bad, contrast one is bad. So here's the speckle, and now I take another realization of the speckle. So how do I take another realization of the speckle? Let's say I 
move the, the piece a little bit, or I take a different laser to do it. And then I take another one and another one, and I do it, let's say, a thousand times. And now I'm going to add all these thousand different pictures. You see, each one of them looks different from the other. This is a speckle, this is a speckle. Their statistical properties are identical. This is the universality, but the specific realization here and here are uncorrelated. They don't look the same. What happens when we add all of them? If we do it coherently, namely we add the amplitudes, we let them interfere, we get this again a speckle pattern with the same bad contrast of one. This is a huge surprise. I hope you're all surprised. Can you raise your hand if you're surprised? <laughs> okay, yeah, G Gabby is surprised, good. So, <laughs> no, Gabby, you shouldn't be surprised. You should know. Lower your hand. So, so this is the first amazing point here. It's not so easy to get rid of them. If you have coherence, even if you take these different realizations and you try to average this noise, the noise will interfere with itself, resulting in having the same bad speckle contrast. You did nothing. So we have no other option, but we have to take again many speckle pictures, but we have to add them incoherently. We have to have the, we have to add the intensity. We have to somehow to make sure that when I take this picture, and this picture, and I sum them, I get the sum of the intensity. I do not get interference. Okay, this is the main point. I have to lose the coherence between these different pictures. If I do that, then I can take average between this one and this one, and because they're all different and I have many, many of them, I will get this picture. You see the speckles are almost invisible. They're almost invisible. And the contrast, this bad property, is almost zero. This is almost uniform. Let me give you another equation and risk it. So here's the equation. The contrast that is remaining is one over the square root of the number of averages. If you worked ever with statistical averaging, or you threw the dice, or you gambled on poker, or, or uh, other things on the internet, you know this rule very well. This is the basic law of statistics. Noise averages is one over square root of number of realizations n. And this is a little bit upsetting because typically people like to have the contrast of the speckles somewhere between one and 3%. This is considered to be human perception. Of course, it changes from person to person. My perception is probably worse at my age, but typically people would agree to look on a picture where these speckles, this noise is between one and 3%. One and 3% is one over 30 to one over 100. Now let's go to this equation. If I did want this to be one to 3%, I need to average somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 realizations, okay? I'm stopping for a moment to, to read the questions. Thankful to the interview. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, I think it, it, takes me, it takes my attention to answer the questions in real time, so I apologize, but I will delay them a little bit. Good questions, though. Um, so let me just come back to my concentration. We cannot average this noise, these speckles, coherently. The coherence generates the speckles, and it will maintain them. It will not allow us to get rid of them. We have to introduce incoherence. Incoherence meaning that the phase relation has to break, and we have to add intensities rather than amplitude. We have to destroy the interference. If we do it, and if we do it somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 times, we will get nice pictures. Okay, that's what we want to do. If somebody looked on the picture that I sent in the invitation, he may have uh, recognized, where is it? Oh, oh, something is stuck. Okay, here it is. Can you see this uh, beautiful picture, which I call exploding speckles? Can you see it looks like an explosion? So we have the same speckle here, but they are sort of exploding. This comes from a bad attempt to try and destroy the speckle by using not the spatial coherence, but rather the temporal coherence, this is for expert, or using different colors. So you would be tempted to say, okay, the laser generates these speckles because it has a very specific color, very specific wavelengths. Let's take many different wavelengths, like red, purple, uh, blue. Each one of them creates a different speckle, and le then let's average them. And because they are different colors, they will not interfere, and this fails. You still have contrast one. 
So this is a very interesting failure, but I don't have time to discuss it. I just want to remember that I have to uh, incoherently uh, change the, the way the speckles look rather than the wavelengths, okay? So how can we take this incoherent sum of 1,000 or 10,000 pictures? So there's a trivial way. We'll just take a picture with the camera and then take another one. We have to make sure that the speckles change a little bit, but this is not so, so difficult because they are so sensitive. So even if you take it on a living person and he breathes, by breathing you move much more than the wavelengths and you will get completely different speckle pattern. So we just take a thousand or 10,000 consecutive pictures of the object and then in the computer you average them and you get rid of speckles. This is the first line, you do it in time. If you take the pictures one by one, of course they do not interfere because the phase is lost. Of course it's the sum of intensities, and, but the problem is this is low. So what we want to do, we want to do it fast. To do it fast, we have to take the pictures in parallel. So we have to use a light source that has many components, 10,000 com components, 10,000 components, and each one of these components will generate a different speckle pattern and each one of these speckle patterns will be incoherent with the other ones. If we can do that, we can avoid speckle fast. And it's important to avoid them fast because sometimes we have to take pictures of fast moving objects, like a bullet or like somebody running, uh, you know, in the corona. So it, you have to do it fast. This is too slow for many applications. And what we do in our group, we use a multi-mode laser. So what is a multi-mode laser? I will tell you in details. But if anyone here ever looked on a, one of the laser books, there are basically two, he probably have seen these modes. This is the Gaussian modes, they have names, this is called the 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 1. Each one of these shapes, they, they are called by, by Hermit Gauss polynomes, if you, if you uh, are interested, can exist in a laser. And we want to have a laser, I'll show you a picture in a moment, that all these modes coexist. Okay, this is what we want. If we can do that, and I'll show you in the next slide how we can do that, then we are done. Why? Because this Gaussian mode will generate a speckle pattern. Then this mode, you see zero one, it's this one, will generate a different speckle pattern. We need to take somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 modes. Each one of these modes has to be incoherent with the other one. And then simultaneously, in parallel, we will get the sum of the intensity of all these speckle pattern. Again, I, I insist it's a sum of intensities because these different modes are incoherent with each other. So we want to have a laser which lacks the basic property of most lasers that I showed you before, namely coherence. We want a laser with a bad coherence function to get this nice picture. How do we do that? So to get a very crude feeling, and I apologize for the laser experts because I'm going to say something terrible and incorrect, but just to give you a feeling why the light coming out of a laser is coherent, usually. The answer is the following. This is how a laser looks. You have gain. Gain is a media where for every photon which enters it, you get, say, two or three photons out. So you go like one, then you have two, then you have four, and then it bounces between mirrors. This is one mirror, this is the other mirror, and this is called the output coupler because it's a little bit transparent. So let's say 90% is reflected and 10% goes out. Okay, so now we have light photons going back and forth, back and forth. Each time they go through this gain, they are amplified. So we have an exponential gain. For one photon after one round trip, we have two and then four and then eight. It's like the corona. It's exponentially going up. In order to do that, the light beams have to reflect bounce between the mirrors. And as you can see with this crude picture, they have to be parallel because we have two plane mirrors. So I hope you remember that parallel rays are the poor man's version of coherent beam. Parallel rays means uniform phase coherent beam. So this is the crude reason why the light, these rays now are going to come out of this output coupler because there's a little bit of transparency and they are going to be parallel, namely coherent, namely they will generate speckles, okay? And we want to undo that. And the way we are undoing that, we are doing something a little bit crazy. We are taking the same laser cavity, you see the two mirrors, you see the gain, the beams are going to get lost, and we put a telescope. This is a telescope. You have two lenses, so it goes like uh, um, uh, 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 anything which is here is imaged here by the telescope. 
just like any, any other telescope. The reason we use a telescope and not a single imaging lens, this is a technical detail, so I say it for the experts, is because we have to make sure that not just the intensity of the light, but also the phase of the light is imaged. And for that, you need a telescope. A single lens doesn't keep the phase of the light, doesn't keep parallel rays parallel. So now that we have this telescope inside the cavity, something very crazy is happening. Anything, any light ray that I put here, will be imaged by the telescope, imaged back, and fulfill the self-consistent condition, and will get amplified and amplified and amplified exponentially. This is why this laser has a name. It's called the generate laser cavity. The generacy means that all the mode distributions here are modes of this cavity. They are self-consistent solution of this oscillator, and that's why they lays. Okay? So this is the way we, are, we can achieve many, many modes, many different modes, which are exactly degenerate. Now, let me tell you, uh, why do I insist on this word degeneracy? Why is it so important? So inside the laser cavity, there is something very cruel happening. All these modes that I told you about, let me remind you how they look, this one and this one and this one, they all compete. They compete on this game. Now, what is, it's called mode competition. What does it mean? It means that, let's say, there are two modes here. They are going back and forth. And one of them is just a little bit better than the other. Just a little bit better. Maybe it has a little bit higher gain. Maybe it has a little bit lower loss. Let's say by 1%, it's better. But now they go back and forth, back and forth many times. And every time they go back and forth, I, the, the good one becomes 1% stronger as compared to the bad one. And what we get again is exponential separation. So mode competition selects the good ones, a little bit like it happens in human society, where the rich become richer, the poor become poorer. And the result is of this mode competition that usually only the strongest one, you know, like in nature, survives. The way it survives, it takes all the gain to itself, and all the other modes are left without any gain, and they exponentially die. So this is why lasers, this is a more maybe a exact explanation why the laser light is coherent. Not only that you have this one mode which is preferential to the other, but also the other ones, even if they are slightly different, if you take these rays and bend them just by a little bit, it will create a small loss, but this loss will be exponentially amplified every time you go through the, through the cavity, and they will die. So typically, the laser will emit a single mode. Usually, it's this one. It's the Gaussian mode but sometimes it's this one, but almost always one. And we don't want one, we want many. How many we want? We want thousands, we want 10,000, we want 100,000. Why do we want so many? Because of this formula, okay? We need many, many of them to get this contrast, this annoying noise below human perception. So does this work? Does this uh, uh, telescope work? Let's check it. And in order to check it, what we do, we sneak, we put this little, we sample a little bit of the light. This is just a piece of glass that reflects a little bit of the mirror. It doesn't interfere with the operation of the laser. And we put a camera. And we take a picture of what goes on here. Now, what we see, we see this big spot. This big spot tells us that we have actually a combination of all these shapes. Take all these shapes and add them, and you will get this spot. Okay? So we have an incoherent source. We'll quantify it in a moment. The next thing we want to do is we want to control the coherence. So let's do the following. Let's put here, just in the focus of this lens, let's put here a small pinhole, a very, very small pinhole. Now, if you remember, in order for the light to go through the pinhole, we need two requirements. We need a good lens, and we have a good lens. We are Weizmann Institute. We are rich, or at least we used to be before the corona. Uh, so we have a good lens. The lens has no aberration. But what is coming here? What comes here is not collimated beam. It's many, many different rays in all directions. So actually, we failed. Remember, we got this big spot. And now we insist. We want to take only the central spot here to go through. The ratio between this area and this area is huge. It's maybe 100,000. So what will happen? There are two possibilities. The first possibility, OK, we will get just this small spot. Let's look on it. Here it is. Now we take a picture of what went through the spot, and it's indeed tiny. This area is many, many thousand times smaller than this area. So we limited the number of modes. You'll see in a moment, this is a single mode. Single mode, thousands of modes. But what happened to the power? We blocked 99.999% of the modes. 
did we lose 99.999% of the power? This would be bad because usually for most applications we need some power. And the magic is no, we didn't lose anything. And the reason is the same process that I told you before, mode competition. So when I try to block the modes inside the laser cavity, it's as if they never existed. They just give away all their energy into this winning mode by this mode competition process. And this single mode, and these hundreds of thousands of modes have the same energy. We didn't lose anything. So we can have this tunable number of modes, or in the language of the talk, tunable coherence without losing anything. And I hope you can see this. It says from one to half a million incoherent modes with almost constant power. So this is the solution that we found. And this is a, a, a merge, the result that I'm showing you here. Now I can tell you what are these two pictures. This picture was taken when this uh, aperture was very small. We had a single mode. We had this good coherence and we got these annoying speckles. And when we opened this aperture and we got many, many modes, in this case about half a million modes, we got this perfect suppression of speckles. <laughs> and this happened fast because that's what I promised you. So this happens in few nanoseconds and this enabled us to, we couldn't shoot a bullet in the lab, <clears throat> which is, could be a nice picture. We were a little bit afraid. So we took something else, which was very fast and we could freeze the motion for a few nanoseconds and get this nice picture rather than this ugly speckled picture. This is a busy slide, so I will not cover all of it. I just wanted to tell you, suppose you're not interested at all in laser imaging. Maybe some of you are not. There are many, many other applications. I, I, I'm just flashing them, uh, starting with material processing. Sometimes you want to process an entire area for welding or for uh, melting, uh, and you want to have uniformity. Let's, uh, let's not discuss this uh, uh, said mouse. This is called optogenetic. Uh, this is laser microscopy. This is called optical coherence tomography. Let's maybe concentrate here. You may know that this autonomous car is now a huge industry, including Israel, and there's lots and lots and lots of uh, Israeli companies which are uh, now hiring lots and lots and lots of the Weizmann students and paying them lots and lots of money, more than their professors, uh, and, and, and they are busy about finding all sorts of uh, sensors that will tell this car that there are cars around it, and one of the options, not the only one, one of the options is laser radar, and imagine what happens if instead of getting a sensing of a car, I get these annoying speckles that would tell me there is a car, there is not a car, and this will jump randomly. So this would not be a good sensor. So speckles would be a big enemy of this technology, as well as the other technologies uh, and the example that I was discussing in detail about laser imaging. <clears throat> I think I'll, I'm getting a little bit late, so I'll skip a little bit. Let me confuse you. Suppose you followed me and you understood what I said so far, so you now we can go home and you say, okay, we understand what are speckles, they are a result of the random interference caused by the coherence of the laser, and we hate them, and we want to get rid of them. But this is now an opposite example, as often happens, and I want to show you two examples, why is we like speckles, or why sometimes speckles are good. So the first example is, again, we take this mouse, probably the cousin of the other mouse, and we shine a laser beam, you see here's the laser beam, on the head of the mouth, and some of the light, by the way, penetrates inside its brain, and then we take an image. We do it in infrared. And what we do, this is how the image looks like. You see it looks nothing special. If you look carefully, you see there's a lot of speckles here, as you should, because we're using a coherent beam. So what we can make of this picture, not a lot, but if we look on these speckles, and locally we look on the contrast of the speckles, and we plot it here. This is done in three lines in MATLAB. So just take some kind of a Fourier filter, uh, take low pass, calculate the, 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 the contrast of this noise, and, and image back to inverse Fourier for the experts here. You see this amazing picture. And what you see are blood vessels. Okay, you see this is a blood vessel, and this is another one, and you can take movies of this, and you can see a stroke uh, for this unfortunate mice. How come? How come I see this? huge, very clear picture of this uh, blood vessel inside, you know, the, the brain of the mouse, so clearly. And the answer is because of speckles. Everything which is static has speckles, but the blood is moving. And something which is moving gives me different realization of speckles as a function of time. And if I integrate over enough time and the mouse is stable enough, I don't want to tell you how you hold him 
so it doesn't move. It's not nice to hear. But also this can be done for humans. So it's, it can be done humanly. So the movement of the blood inside the vessel destroys the speckle contrast by the same process of incoherent image uh, averaging that we discussed before. And this serves as a contrast, a beautiful contrast mechanism that you can use to uh, study the, uh, the, the blood motion inside vessel, inside the brain of a mouse or a person. So you see speckles are sometimes useful. Another even more common example is this optical mouth. Uh, everybody's using it. I don't know if you bother to think, you know there's a little LED here which sends red light uh, on the table and then it ref uh, returned and there's a little bit detector. All these things cost like a few dollars, so it's amazing. But how does it really work? So let me tell you in two stages. Suppose on the table we had a ruler, a very precise ruler, and then as we move the mouse, the camera sees the ruler is moving, but it knows that the ruler is not moving because it sticks to the table. So it knows that the mouse is moving, and then it understands that you are moving it, and, and it understands that you're trying to sort of signal the computer to move the, the something. But we don't have this ruler on the table. It doesn't exist. If you look on the table or on a piece of paper, or on, uh, sometimes you do it even on your, on your leg, it's, it's just a random media, it's just a flat random media. So what is this ruler? Where is this ruler hiding that we know that something is moving? And the answer is speckles. So the, this array, maybe you can see it here. They do it with infrared, so you're not supposed to, but if you look carefully, you can see it. So we actually have a speckle pattern which is moving with the mouse, and this is the ruler, even though it's completely random. But because it has this universal statistical properties, you can actually use it as a precise ruler. I didn't give the exact explanation, but I hope you got sort of the idea. So speckles are useful. I think I'm almost finishing, so I want to confuse you even further. I promised you in the, in the introduction that I will show you why speckles are bad and then why speckles are good. And now I want to show you that coherence is very good. So the same coherence that we had before, that we fought, now we want to fight to gain it. And I'm choosing this example. This is another thing that we are studying in, in, in my group, in Weizmann. Uh, uh, what I'm showing you here is a picture of more than 1,000 lasers. I think there's 1,500 of them. So each one of these spots is a small laser, which is coming out of the screen towards you. Okay? Why do you want to use 1,500 lasers? Maybe because you want a strong beam, and the strongest laser that you can find is not strong enough. Okay, let's say you can only buy lasers with one watt, because they don't want to sell you the stronger one, but you need 1,000 watts. So what you'll do, you'll take 1,000 lasers, and each laser will give you one watt, so in total you'll have 1,000 watts. That's what you want. And, and this is sometimes called the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. 1,000 times one watt is one kilowatt. But the other thing that you want with lasers, I remind you, is you want to concentrate this energy on a small spot. Or you want to reach to the moon, right? And, and this will not happen. Why? Because each laser here, this small laser, let's say it's coherent, but it is not coherent with the laser besides it. They don't have the same phase. So you have 1,000 different sources, 1,000 different lasers, which are incoherent with each other. What it means is that if I go far away, we call it far field, or I try to focus it, I will get this huge bad spot. So I have a lot of energy, but this energy is spread over a large area, so I cannot cut a nice cut or, or, or make a surgery. What happens if we can somehow make each one of these lasers have the same phase as all the other ones? Okay? I want to phase lock the phase of all the lasers. I want to make them coherent with each other. Don't be confused, before we took a single laser and we asked, is it coherent with itself? And sometimes the answer was yes, sometimes the answer was no. Now we're asking an even more strange question. Can we take two lasers and make them coherent with each other? And surprisingly, the answer is yes, and I see people are starting to leave, so I'll finish very, very soon. The answer is yes, and when you do that, something very dramatic happens. Let me just show it. And I'm apologizing, I'm not explaining how we do it. I'm not explaining the methods that we make the lasers coherent with each other. But let's just look at the end result. This is the result, the same uh, picture when I go far, far away from this array, but now the lasers are all coherent with each other. And what you can see in this far field picture, far, far away, is something very dramatically different than this one. 
the energy in this picture and the energy here are the same. One thousandth of the energy of a single laser. But here you see most of the energy, it's about 80%, is concentrated into this tiny spot, like we expect with coherent radiation. Like we expect if we had just a single laser beam. The reason we have these other spots, this is for experts, because this is a periodic structure, so we have higher orders of diffraction. These are the higher order of diffraction. If you ask what is the ratio between this area and this area, the answer is 1,000. If you don't believe me, you, you can measure later. So I'm able to get 1,000 smaller spots with the same energy, namely the intensity here, the brightness of the beam, the ability to cut, the temperature, is 1,000 times larger than here, just because I now have a well-defined phase relation between the 1,000 laser. This is the power of coherence. This is why we like coherence very much, except from the cases that we don't like it. This is a, again, it's a joke, don't, don't panic. This is the reference for Lucas et al. This is the a death uh, ship that they build. This is this huge laser they build. They want to destroy the planet of the rebels. And as you can see, they understood what we understand, and they understood that you have to take all these beams, you have to coherently combine them, as you see here, and now this goes and bye-bye to the planet. This is a more uh, realistic example. This comes from DARPA. So DARPA has this project. They ask companies, take the strongest laser that you can find. So this is the output of the strongest laser that uh, Lockheed Martin could find. This is about 100 kilowatt. It's the strongest fiber laser that now exists, CW, not PALS. But this is not enough to destroy something, let's say, you know, rocket, for many kilometers. You can only do it far away because the, the, the light goes out. So now uh, one laser doesn't work. So DARPA told these people, okay, take many. And this company, I think it's Lockheed Martin, took seven. You see one, two, three, four, five, six around and one in the center. So now you have seven lasers. This is not as, we had 1,000, they only have seven. But we had one watt and they have 100 kilowatt. So it's not so easy. You see it's built very, you know, with a lot of steel. Uh, and then it's not enough. You can, it's not enough to take seven lasers. It's not enough to combine these seven beams. You have to do it coherently. And this is now done, and this is the state of the art. So what you're seeing here, this is the strongest CW laser that can shoot, you know, good things or bad things, depends what you want. And it cannot uh, be composed of a single laser because the single laser has a limit. This is a stronger laser that exists in the market. Actually, they sell it. But if you take many of them and you want to benefit from that, you have to do it coherently. And I think I'll skip the last part, which is how to build a computer from this laser. And I'll go to my summary. Uh, and the summary just reminds you that if the lasers are coherent, thousand lasers are coherent, we can concentrate all this energy into a tiny spot, much smaller than if they are incoherent. On the other way, if we are interested to do imaging, or one of the other applications that I showed, like uh, self-driving cars, then we actually don't like coherent and we want to suppress it. And I showed you how we do that. And then these three topics I didn't cover, so I, um, I will skip them. And I want to end my talk and maybe leave some time for question with this sort of amusing uh, movie. What you see here is the same principle of controlling the intensity and controlling the coherence of the beam. If you ask what is it good for, this is a beam that as it is propagate, let's do it again. Sorry. Yeah. It's not happy. Mm. Okay, there it is. Last time. So we have a beam propagating in free space, and because of the special property of its coherence, it is changing the shape from Superman to Batman. If you remember, in the Gotham City, when they needed help, they shined into the sky the picture of Batman. But sometimes Batman is <laughs> far away and you want Superman. So this is a more useful beam because as it is propagating, it is sometimes looks like Batman, sometimes looks like Superman. Even if you don't need superheroes, I think you should appreciate the ability to control the shape of the beam by controlling their coherence properties. And this is a good time to stop. And I show uh, uh, some of the students uh, that uh, worked with me on this problem. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you uh, raise your hand, I know that you survived until now. Yeah. Okay, so, good. Um, I am now, uh, let's do the following. So, 
it's completely polite to go out now because this is going to be a little bit of answering questions which are probably specific. So please feel free to, uh, to, to leave and I will go over the questions uh, and I will answer a few of them for the few people that ask them or that are interested. Uh, okay, so I say goodbye to everyone and thank you very much for staying with me. Bye bye. And now answering the questions. Uh, if anybody sends me an email, somebody wants a link, so I, definitely anyone that will send me an email, I will send him a, 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 the slides. I think there's also a recording somewhere uh, with the Lishkat uh, Mehandesim. Um, somebody asked about the angular extent of the sun, because I told that the sun is incoherent. That's exactly correct. So, Naftali, uh, Naftali Hayat, you're absolutely right. The fact that the sun is not a point source is just a manifestation to the fact that it's not spatially uh, coherent. Because I remind you, if you remember the picture, parallel rays will only emerge when you have a, a point source in the focus of the beam. So this is just a different world. It's not something else. Uh, but I'm referring to the spatial coherence. Therefore, uh, it's exactly the angular extent of the uh, sun. Naftali, you're absolutely right. Uh, Omer, you mentioned there's a big difference between coherence and incoherence focus size. The difference is only a factor of two. So Omer asks, is there only a factor of two between coherence and incoherence? No, the answer is no. Uh, you remember correctly that the factor of two is the factor of point spread function, which is for the experts only. Uh, but I was referring to something very different, to coming with a good beam, which will be focused to a diffraction limit, as opposed to coming with a bad beam of non-collimated beams. So my factor is sort of trivial, your factor is advanced. And my factor just depends on the quality of the beam. And I gave the example of the sun just to give a big number. And for the example that I gave with the solar tower of the Weizmann, maybe it's not nice to bad, say bad things about the solar tower of Weizmann, I show that the best effort of the solar people in Weizmann were only able to concentrate the energy of the sun to a spot size which is 12 orders of magnitude worse than what every undergraduate can do with its lens. So the answer is not because they are bad engineers, it's because of the incoherence or the bad quality of the beam of the sun, and this is not a factor of two. This is a factor of whatever. Okay, then uh, 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 Jacob Engelberg, if he's still here, asked how we solve the problem of mode competition. I think, Jacob, you're right, I didn't say this word, so you asked me to explain again, but I explained for the first time. So I cannot solve the problem of mode competition completely. Uh, it exists. What I can do is I can generate, I can align the telescope ever so carefully, like Sagi, Sagi, raise your hand again. <laughs> and if the telescope imaging inside my degenerate cavity is perfectly aligned, then the degeneracy between the mode is so exact that in spite of the mode competition, uh, I can still get many, many modes. Maybe not all the modes that are there, maybe some of them will die, but may, enough will exist. And enough, in our case, it's about 100,000. Uh, I'll just say one sentence, because still there are 30 people, so probably not all of them are experts. There are other factors which affect mode competition. So I don't want to get into them, so I'll just give one simple example. And the example is modes, in order to compete, they have to overlap at the gain medium. So the modes that I showed you before, if you remember them, and I won't go there, they have a large overlap. Typically, if you just take two arbitrary modes, like the Laguerre Gauss 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, they have on the order of 50% overlap. This is a lot. This will guarantee that they have a lot of mode competition. But there are crazy systems, and we're actually studying one of them, where the modes are untypical. So the physicists would call them localized modes. We get them by entering a random diffuser inside the laser cavity. If you are a physicist, you probably heard about localization in terms of Anderson localization and related phenomena. We have something which is similar to that. We have localized modes in the cavity. They look completely different than the Gauss Gaussian modes that I showed you before. And they have this strange property that they overlap le less and therefore they compete less and they should coexist better. We are working on it now. I, unfortunately, our results are not that great but we are uh, hopeful that this would be like an interesting concept. So this is my answer to Jacob on mode competition. Uh, Jacob asked another question. Why using a range of wavelengths doesn't help? I recall that Goodman says that wavelength diversity can be used to reduce speckles, since each wavelength gives a different pattern and they are average. So you are right, Jacob. Under some conditions, you can use wavelengths uh, diversity 
to get rid of speckles. Uh, let me simplify it because there are still many people. So these conditions include mainly thick scattering media. I say again, thick scattering media. If the scattering media that generates a speckle is many, many wavelengths thick, then wavelength diverging, uh, diversity will help. I don't have the time to explain why. For thin scattering media, and I'll give two examples, uh, one, uh, the more typical is reflection from the wall or reflection from the paper. Then the different random phases are on the order of a tiny fraction of a millimeter, and their wavelength diverg diversity does not help. So Goodman is right, but only in some untypical cases. If you want to remember a single line, so wavelength diversity only rarely helps to reduce speckle, but spatial incoherence or spatial multimode or spatial diversity always is effective. Okay, this is for Jacob. Uh, and anonymous ask how to lock the phase of different lasers. So I don't have time to discuss that, but please send me an email and I will send you like 20 papers that we wrote about that. So it's a rich field. Uh, I'll just say the following that you can couple them. And if you go to YouTube and you write uh, on the search of YouTube, you write coupled oscillators or coupled metronome, you will see a very nice movie where you take several clocks, several metronomes, and you couple them by put them, putting them on a two Coca-Cola bottles and you see that they synchronize. So this would give you a rough feeling how we couple the phase, uh, how we phase lock the phase of the lasers. We have to couple them. And the coupling has to be dissipative. This is all I can say in this short time. Omer asks, where can we find more information about the speckle statistics you did not have time to cover? What laser book do you recommend for a vacation time, for Corona time? So there's an entire book written by Goodman, the same Goodman that Jacob discussed, and it's called Speckles, and it's about speckles. Uh, so there's like 250 pages, anything that you uh, want to read about speckles. I would highly recommend several papers by Isaac Freud for bar -Ilan University. I think he's retired now, but the papers are still on the web. And I think they are the most beautiful because they discuss the statistical properties of the speckles from a physicist's point of view, which I think is beautiful. There are several works by Michael Berry, who's you know, a classic, and he also talks about speckles, but this is just one example. Uh, Alex asked, what are the ways to synchronize lasers? I guess synchronize, is, I, maybe I use this word, is to lock the phase of the laser. So it's the same answer that I gave to Anonymous. Send me an email, you get linked to 20 papers or look on synchronization of metronomes in YouTube. I'll, actually, I'll show you this movie in a moment, if you stay. I have it on my screen. I'm if sure, I'm, somebody asked in Hebrew, Hillel, I'm if sure not laser coherent to full of film. Can you do bad things with a coherent beam combining? I assume that you can, but I'm in Weizmann and I only look for peaceful uh, purposes. So I'm not interested in destroying anything. What prevents the modes winning over the others in the multimode cavity with the telescope inside? This is Naftali. I hope that this is before I answered and not after. Uh, so what prevents them is mostly the fact that the degeneracy is rather exact. So the mode competition needs some tiny difference to exponentially amplify. And as you probably know, even exponential process, you have to seed them with some initial difference. And if the initial seeding is too small, and there's also another, uh, because it's the second time I'm asked, there's a finite time for this process. The photons just go back and forth a certain number of time, and then they leave, crudely speaking. So if the initial uniformity is good enough, even in spite of this exponential amplification, it stays rather uniform and we still are able to maintain uh, all the modes. By the way, the modes don't have to be exactly the same intensity. If, you, if I give you the ability, diversity of, let's say, a factor of two or three in the intensity of the different modes, the suppression of the speckle is almost as effective. So I get the one over square root of n rule that I discussed will be maintained. You don't need all the modes to be exactly to have the same power. So this helps also a little bit. And I think, uh, okay, Shlomo Glaser asked, uh, what is the meaning of speckles in three-dimensional laser picture? I don't know exactly how to answer that uh, because uh, it doesn't explain what he means by three-dimensional laser picture. Does he mean a hologram? Does he mean, so I, 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 I cannot answer this question. Uh, Dan Wagner asked, if I recall in your group, someone made a, a mirror out of a wall via SLM. Can you say something versus the two methods for imaging? This is true. 
So we actually, and I, I, this is one of the slides that I skip where we replaced one of the mirrors with a special light modulator. Here it is. This is just funny. So this is a special light modulator. You have to be careful, it's very expensive. And when it's inside the laser cavity, it can burn. But if you are able not to burn it, you can actually control the mode very carefully. And these are two very beautiful examples. This we call an Einstein mode. This is an experimental data. And this we call a Newton mode. So we can generate whatever mode shape we want from the laser cavity. What would I need a laser where the shape of the mode is Einstein or Newton? I don't know, but there are actually applications where you can want to control the mode. I show you this Batman Superman thing, which we do something like this. This is probably more like the basic research aspect of what we do. I wouldn't recommend any of you to go to the store and buy a laser with this very expensive and um, very destructible object inside. Um, so that's what I have to say about the SLM. Can properties of scattering media be characterized by speckle? Uh, absolutely, this is Alex is asking. The answer is absolutely yes, but I'm not an expert, so I don't want, want to comment. And Omer ask again, who are the encircled people in the last slide? So come to me and I'll tell you, Omer. And because there are no more questions and I don't want to, oh, sorry. Doron Nakar is asking, can we measure distance by taking several spectral pictures while moving? Uh, I vaguely remember that there are things like that, but again, I'm not an expert. It sounds, it sounds reasonable that you can do it, but I'm not an expert, so I, I prefer not to speculate. Uh, but I can say the following, that uh, um, I just showed you, I think one or two applications of speckle. I showed you the blood flow and I showed you the laser mouse. There are probably, you know, 50 or so applications, and maybe this one is one of them. And I know maybe about 10 or 15 of them, uh, but, uh, you know, it's like always like that. Some people like speckle, some people hate speckle. Uh, so it's always the best thing to do is to be able to control them when you want them to have them, when you don't want them to don't have them. And this is maybe the focus of, of our work. And maybe I didn't stress it enough, but we are concentrating on tunability of the coherence of the source. Tunability means that I can have high coherence with all the big advantages that we discussed, but with the speckles, and then I can destroy the coherence and destroy the speckle. And I'll end up very fast before there's any other question. And again, thank you very much all for staying so late and good evening. Bye-bye.